So chemical reactions are the heart and soul of chemistry, and some of them are extremely fascinating and explosive, and some are very subtle, but either way, we all like to look at chemical reactions. And so this chapter is going to look at that, This our second unit here, chapter 4 in the book, and we're going to look at major types of chemical reactions, especially the ones that we're going to study here in this course, including what we're going to talk about precipitation reactions. A lot of these important reactions uh, that I'm going to describe to you involve ions in aqueous solution, meaning dissolved in water. So that's what we're going to look at here first. So first up, we've got this ionic theory of solution. And Mr. Arcranius, he came up with this theory, and it actually was very not well received as his, doc um, his doctoral dissertation. But um, a few years later, he was actually up for a Nobel Prize in chemistry for this theory. But at the time, again, not so well received. But as you see here, certain substances, when dissolved in water, will produce freely moving ions and allow that solution to conduct an electric current. And so the substances that do that we call electrolytes. So as you see there, dissolving in water to give it an electrically conducting solution. Ionic compounds, ionic solids, most definitely are electrolytes. As soon as you put them in water and they dissolve, you've got positive cations and negative anions floating around. Molecular compounds, some of them also do that, ones that dissolve into ions, strong acids, for example. So like hydrochloric acid, when it is dissolved into water, breaks apart into hydrogen ions and chloride ions. So that's an example. And sulfuric acid is another example. We'll look at some strong acids here a little later in this chapter. This is a little electrolyte tester, conductivity tester, and you can see that light bulb is lit up, and I'll show you that in class, but any electrolyte will conduct an electric current in solution. A non-electrolyte will not. Non-electrolytes non dissolve in water to create a non-conducting solution. So molecular compounds that don't break apart into ions. You just have molecular compounds mixing with molecular water, sugar or methanol, for example. So in our pictures here, sodium chloride, we got positive sodium ions and negative chloride ions. That is an electrolyte solution. Here we just have sugar molecules mixed in among water molecules. And so that is a non-electrolyte solution. Now when these electrolytes do dissolve in water and produce ions, they do so to varying extents. So we can call them either strong or weak electrolytes. A strong electrolyte exists almost entirely as ions. As soon as we put sodium chloride into water, it breaks apart into sodium and chloride ions and stays that way almost exclusively. A weak electrolyte, you'll see a very small percentage of ions. And this is more typical with our molecular compounds, not the strong acids I just talked about. But if you look here, we see ammonia. When we put ammonia into water, we get the formation of ammonium and hydroxide ions, but only about 3%, because the reverse reaction also takes over and is actually stronger and more favorable. The ammonium and the hydroxide will react and going back to being ammonia and water. And so when we look at a description, a pictorial des description here, a non-electrolyte solution, there would be absolutely no ions in solution. So we wouldn't see our light bulb light up. A weak electrolyte will have a very few amount of ions. And so we'll see a very subtle glowing of the light bulb. Our strong electrolytes, you'll see many, many ions. And because of that, the current will flow much more freely and we'll see a much stronger response on our conductivity tester. So with so many ionic compounds out there and molecular compounds, but mostly we're going to focus here on ionic compounds, how do we know which ones will dissolve into water? Well, for that we have what we call our solubility rules. And I've made a chart for you that you'll be able to use. But here essentially sums up the most common universal solubility rules, and especially the ones that we need for this course and the substances we'll look at. 
But you can take a look at these, and again, I've printed them up for you. The important one is rule number one. Now, in the past, AP told us that we had to memorize all of these, but now they're focusing mostly on this one. And you should always know that group 1A, which is lithium, sodium, and potassium, yes, rubidium, cesium, and francium, but not very common and not very used in the lab. But all of our group 1A and ammonium compounds are definitely soluble, with no exceptions. Acetate and nitrates, same thing. Um, but again, that first rule is what AP says that you should definitely know. If they have any other questions involving solubility, involving these other rules, well, then they're going to give you some information about that. But when we're do doing a lot of work in class with these, you'll have those ready and available when we need them. So how is this going to help us? Well, we're going to look at some equations. We use chemical equations, as it says there, to describe chemical reactions. And there are different types. The ones you're familiar with are what we call molecular equations. They're regular equations. Everything is written as if they are molecules, even if they might exist in solution as ions. So here we see the reaction between barium hydroxide and potassium carbonate. All right, and these both say that they are aqueous. And we can check that on our solubility rules, barium hydroxide and potassium carbonate. Barium hydroxide is a soluble hydroxide. It's an exception. And potassium carbonate, all group 1 compounds are soluble. And you can see that down here. Even though carbonates are mostly insoluble, group 1A ones are an exception. And then you see that barium carbonate and potassium hydroxide are the react or sorry <laughs> the products. Well, that's great, but I just said that when we put these compounds, ionic compounds in water, they do break apart into ions. And so what we can write is a complete ionic equation. And that is taking into account the ionic theory that we just talked about. So when barium hydroxide goes into water, it breaks apart into the barium ion and two hydroxides. Potassium carbonate breaks apart into two potassium ions and carbonate ions. Barium carbonate is insoluble. It's a solid, so it stays together. And the potassium hydroxide breaks apart into, whoops, hold on. You never saw that typo. So the potassium hydroxide, two potassium hydroxides break into two potassium ions and two hydroxide ions. And that looks pretty daunting because there's ions all over the place. But if you look, on both sides of the equation, we have some repeating ions. So on the reactant side, I have two hydroxide ions. On the product side, I have two hydroxide ions. On the reactant side, I have two potassium ions. On the product side, I have two potassium ions. They're really not doing anything. They're in the reactants and the product side. So what we call them are spectator ions. They're ions not taking part in this reaction. So we can just go ahead and get rid of them from our equation, because they're really not doing anything as far as the reaction is concerned. So what we end up having is what we call a net ionic equation. It's the complete ionic equation taking out the spectator ions. It shows what's really happening at the particle level, at the ion level. And so here we see that when I mix, again, back up here, barium hydroxide and potassium carbonate, I really am only looking at the fact that the barium ions and the carbonate ions are going to come together and form this insoluble barium carbonate. So barium carbonate being insoluble, they stay as solids. And if you have a molecular compound or a weak electrolyte, they stay together as molecules. And we'll see plenty of examples of that. So essentially, what this net ionic equation says any source of barium ions and any source of carbonate ions, when you mix them together, you're always going to end up with this net ionic equation. So for example, if I had barium nitrate and sodium carbonate reacting, 
and it, you know, molecularly it says that barium carbonate and sodium nitrate is going to form. And if I look at that complete ionic equation, again, I can see those spectator ions. Nitrates are on both sides of the equation, and sodiums are on both sides of the equation. Spectators. And again, we end up with the same net ionic equation. So these net ionic equations are going to be very useful and very practical as we go through lots of different topics here in AP Chem. Most of the reactions we look at in this course fall into one of three categories, precipitation, acid base, and oxidation reduction. So let's look at precipitation reactions here first. First, remember what a precipitate is. It's an insoluble solid compound that forms during a chemical reaction that is in solution. And so we can look at this lovely picture. If I mix potassium iodide, which is in this beaker, with lead nitrate, which is in this beaker, and you can see we've got potassium and iodide ions on the left, lead and nitrate ions in the middle here, and when they mix together, you start seeing the formation of this precipitate solid lead to iodide. And then in solution above it is are the spectator ions, potassium nitrate. And so that's what a precipitation reaction looks like. How can you tell if one's going to occur? And if it does, what product should you expect? At the molecular equation level, they take the form of a funky word called metathesis, meaning exchange reaction. It appears to involve the exchanging of parts between reactions, reactants, sorry. And this is a typical, what we would look at as a double displacement, double replacement reaction. So if I had barium chloride and silver nitrate, and in the old days you would write out Barium chloride plus two silver nitrates will make two silver chlorides and barium nitrate. But how does this play out on the particle level? Well, we need to look at the complete ionic and net ionic equations. If this is truly a precipitation reaction, then either the silver chloride or the barium nitrate better be uh, an insoluble product. And if I look back at my solubility rules, then I should be able to check that out. And here we see right there that silver chloride is indeed an exception. It is insoluble. So that's how we're going to know that this reaction goes. All right. So my complete ionic, my barium chloride, is going to be barium ions plus 2 chloride ions, and my silver nitrate, I'm going to have two silver ions and two nitrate ions. And um, for my products, we just checked silver chloride is in fact insoluble, and then I've got barium and two, oh, sorry, and two nitrates. So that is my complete ionic, and then I can look for my spectators. I see a barium ion on both sides, and I see nitrate ions on both sides. So I can get rid of, I can cancel out my spectator ions. And when I do that, I end up with my net ionic. I'm just going to put the positives first, because that's how I usually write stuff. Two silvers plus two chlorides will make two silver chlorides. And just like we do when we balance equations, I don't need all those twos. So I just cancel those out as well. And that is my net ionic equation for this precipitation reaction. So when I was wondering, will barium chloride and silver nitrate be a precipitation reaction, I looked at the molecular reaction, I found out that silver chloride is in fact insoluble, and I was able to write my complete ionic and net ionic equations from that. And don't worry, we'll do plenty of practice on this topic. See you in class.